students. I hope you're having a great day today. My name is Torres and I want to take a moment to thank you for joining me for a little Psych 101. In this video, we will learn about ethics in psychology. This video has five overarching ideas. One, human and animal subjects have rights. Two, psychologists are bound by ethical guidelines. Three, Codes of conduct have steadily evolved since the 1970s. Four, institutional review boards, or IRBs, monitor compliance of federal regulations for all human subjects. And five, institutional animal care and use committees, IACUCs, monitor compliance of federal regulations for animal subjects. The topic of this video will focus on the vocabulary on this slide. You can find this information in the Google Slide presentation and in your Psych 101 Key Vocabulary Google Doc. Both of these files are linked in the description box below. So what are ethics? Ethics are rules that govern individual and social actions. They are mandatory principles that are created to serve humane values over and above benefits to a researcher or institution. Ethics promote the overarching goal of research, which is knowledge, truth, and the avoidance of error. They support the values required for collaborative work, such as respect, equity, and justice. In the field of psychology, the American Psychological Association, or APA, is responsible for setting the ethical guidelines for human and animal research. For over a hundred years, there was very little oversight for psychological studies and this resulted in a lot of unethical studies. This was especially true for vulnerable populations, such as children, people of color, women, and incarcerated people. The history of contemporary human subjects pr protections began in 1947 with the Nuremberg Code, developed by Nuremberg Military Tribunal as standards by which to judge the human experimentation conducted by the Nazis. The code captures many of what are now taken to be the basic principles governing the ethical conduct of researching involving human subjects. Ten points that defined permissible medical experiments were proposed by two American doctors that had worked with the prosecution during the trials. These ten points became known as the Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code include the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. The experiment should be as to yield fruitful results for the good of society, unprocurable by any other methods or means of study, and not random or unnecessary in nature. The experiment should be so designed and based on the results of animal experimentation and a knowledge of the natural history of the disease or other problem under study that the anticipated results will justify the performance of the experiment. The experiment should be so conducted as to avoid all unnecessary physical and mental suffering and injury. No experiment should be conducted where there is an a priori reason to believe that death or disabling injury will occur, except perhaps in those experiments where the experimental physicians also serve as subjects. The degree of risk to be taken should never exceed that determined by the humanitarian importance of the problem to be solved by the experiment. Proper preparations should be made and adequate facilities provided to protect the experimental subject against even remote possibilities of injury, disability, or death. The experiment should be conducted only by scientifically qualified persons. The highest degree of skill and care should be required through all stages of the experiment of those who conduct or engage in the experiment. During the course of the experiment, the human subject should be at liberty to bring the experiment to an end if he or she has reached the physical or mental state where continuation of the experiment seems to be impossible. During the course of the experiment, the scientist in charge must be prepared to terminate the experiment at any stage if he has probable cause to believe in the exercise of good faith, superior skill, and careful judgment required of him that a continuation of the experiment is likely to result in injury, disability, or death to the experimental subject. Looking at this timeline, it's clear that unethical experiments 
were not completely deterred by the enactment of the Nuremberg Code. Several egregious experiments were still conducted after 1947. For example, from 1953 to 1964, the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA, engaged in various operations in the attempt to manipulate the human mind. Using LSD, scientists around the world became interested in its ability to be used for both defensive and offensive measures in the interest of national security. Experiments including administering LSD to CIA employees, military personnel, doctors, government agents, prostitutes, mentally ill patients, and members of the general public in order to study their reactions, usually without the subject's knowledge. Subjects that were under the psychedelic influence of LSD were locked in sensory deprivation chambers or forced to listen to a tape loop of the patient's most self-degrading statements over and over through headphones after the patient had been restrained in a straitjacket. We see lots of references to MK Ultra in popular culture. For example, the Netflix series Stranger Things does allude to these same type of sensory deprivation, mind-altering experimentation on vulnerable populations like children. One prime example of an ethical trade-off by the scientific community was the case of Henrietta Lacks. When Henrietta Lacks, a black woman in Maryland, was being treated for cervical cancer, her cells were taken into the lab and grown continuously in a culture. Her cells were the first ones that were able to be reproduced in a lab setting. However, her cells were taken without her consent. Though the research that has been done using her cells, which are now referred to as HeLa cells, has done immeasurable good for medical science, there were deep injustices that she and her family experienced. Although companies had made billions and billions of dollars using HeLa cells in the development of medical treatments and pharmaceuticals, Henrietta's family could never afford consistent health insurance despite suffering from chronic illnesses. It wasn't until 1971 that her family even became aware that her cells existed and not until very recently that they were granted any real say as to how researchers could use these cells. As information about the unethical studies continued to reach the public, there was increased public concern, which led to a congressional action and the National Research Act of 1974. President Nixon established the National Commission for Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, and he charged this commission to consider boundaries between practice and research, assessment of role of risk versus benefit in research, guidelines for selection of subjects, and informed consent. In 1979, the commission submitted the report to President Carter. This report is referred to as the Belmont Report. Even with the best safeguards in place, the codes were not always followed. In 1981, the Department of Health and Human Services and Food and Drug Administration issued regulations based on the Belmont Report. The document, known as Title 45 CFR Part 46, codified the Belmont Report's findings. The 45 CFR 46 lists the element of the common rule, the requirements for standard of ethics for all government-funded research in the United States. It is continuously updated as more information and concerns come to light. According to the 45 CFR 46, a human subject is defined as a living individual about whom an investigator, whether professional or student, is conducting research. If the researcher is trying to obtain information or biospecimens through intervention or interaction with the individual and uses studies or analyzes the information or biospecimens, or if the researcher obtains, uses, studies, analyzes, or generates identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens. The researcher must abide by the regulations set forth in 45 CFR 46. Before beginning any experimentation, researchers must 
obtain approval for their study from an institution's institutional review board, also known as an IRB. The IRB is a committee of administrators, scientists, and community members that review each proposal for research that involve human participants. They exist at all research institutions that receive federal support for research involving human participants. An IRB has to have at least five members. There must be a mix of both male and female committee members. They must be a mix of professionals and laypersons. They must also include an external member that is not affiliated with the institution. They must represent the community and all members must be present for reviews. The IRB's code of conduct is guided by the principles outlined in the Belmont Report and have federal oversight. The purpose of the IRB is to ensure protection of human subjects. It's not to judge the merits of the research proposal. If a proposal seems poorly conceived or incomplete, the IRB should not withhold approval if the proposal meets the regulatory guidelines for ethical treatment of its human participants. So just because the members of the committee might conceptualize the study differently does not mean that their proposal should be denied. Relatedly, IRB members should not decline a proposal on the basis of political, religious, or moral perspectives that may be in conflict with the ideas presented in the research proposal. As I already mentioned, IRBs must be guided by the principles outlined in the Belmont Report. Specifically, the first protective principle stemming from the Belmont Report is the principle of respect for persons, also known as human dignity. This dictates that researchers must work to protect research participants' autonomy while also ensuring full disclosure of factors surrounding the study including potential harms and benefits. According to the Belmont Report, an autonomous person is an individual capable of deliberation about personal goals and of acting under the direction of such deliberation. To ensure participants have the autonomous right to self-determination, researchers must ensure that potential participants understand that they have a right to decide whether or not to participate in research studies voluntarily and that declining to participate in any research will not affect their access to current or subsequent care. Also, self-determined participants must have the ability to ask researcher questions and the ability to comprehend questions asked by the researcher. The next principle is the principle of beneficence and non-maleficence, which means that benefits must be maximized and harm must be minimized. Beneficence refers to acting in such a way to benefit others while promoting their welfare and safety. Although not specifically mentioned by name, the biomedical ethical principle of non-maleficence, do no harm, also appears within the Belmont Report section on beneficence. The beneficence principle includes two specific research aspects. First, the participant's right to freedom from harm and discomfort, and two, the participant's right to protection from exploitation. The final principle contained in the Belmont Report is the principle of justice, which pertains to participants' right to fair treatment and right to privacy. The selection of the types of participants desired for research study should be guided by a research question and requirements so that as not to exclude any group and to be as representative of the overall target population as possible. When attempting to apply the general principles of conducting research, there are five requirements that must be considered. Respect for persons requires that subjects, to the degree that they are capable, be given the opportunity to choose what shall or shall not happen to them. This opportunity is provided when adequate standards for informed consent are satisfied. Informed consent is the process of informing a research participant about what to expect during an experiment and then obtaining the person's consent to participate. The consent must include information about any potential risks involved, the implication or reason for the research, 
notification that the participation is voluntary, notification that any data collected will be kept confidential. Protected populations like children and incarcerated people also have the same rights. Children must have parental consent and their own assent before participating in the study. It is not sufficient to only have parental consent. Incarcerated people also have the same rights and cannot be punished or rewarded for their consent. Informed consent in research is only valid if it is voluntarily given. The element of informed consent requires conditions free of coercion and undue influence. Coercion occurs when an overt threat of harm is intentionally presented by one person to another in order to obtain compliance. Undue influence, by contrast, occurs through an offer of an excessive, unwarranted, inappropriate, or improper reward or other overture in order to obtain compliance. Also, inducements that would ordinarily be acceptable may become undue influences if the subject is especially vulnerable. So for example, an incarcerated person cannot be coerced into a research experiment with a promise of time served, or a promise of parole, or a promise of wiping out their record. Similarly, in the workplace, a person cannot be coerced into participating in a study with threats that they will lose their job or receive a demotion if they do not comply. On the other hand, they also cannot be given a promotion if they decide to volunteer. So it has to be done without any sort of pressure to participate in the study. A third application of the Belmont Report is humans' right to anonymity and confidentiality. The participant's privacy must be protected. No identities and actions may be revealed. A researcher must not share any results that could match a participant and their specific responses. Also, a researcher will not identify the source of any data as well. Anonymity and confidentiality are two different things. Confidentiality refers to a condition in which the researcher knows the identity of the research subject, but takes steps to protect that identity by being discovered by others. Anonymity is a condition in which the identity of the individual subjects is not known to the researchers. Anonymity is not as common in human subjects research because human subject research requires signed consent. The next application is the method of ascertaining the risk involved in a study. Participants cannot be placed in any significant mental or physical risk. In order to meet this standard, the method of ascertaining risk must be explicit. Further, brutal or inhumane treatment of human subjects is never morally justified. The risks should be reduced to only those necessary to achieve the objective of the research. If the research involves significant risk or serious impairment, as in testing an experimental drug to fight a serious disease, the review by the IRB should be extraordinary in order to justify that level of risk. Finally, when vulnerable populations are involved in the research, the appropriateness of involving them at all needs to be explicitly demonstrated. Sometimes deception is necessary to prevent the participant's knowledge of the research question affecting the results as long as it is not considered harmful. Deception means to purposely mislead the experiment's participants in order to maintain the integrity of the experiment. When this is necessary, a research subject must be debriefed. When the experiment is over, participants are told complete and truthful information about the experiment and its ultimate conclusion. About 90% of psychological research involves animal subjects. Animal subject research is a laboratory experiment that uses animals to study the development and progression of diseases and or behavior. 
Animal studies also test how safe and effective new treatments are before they are tested on people. This is especially the case when the research would be unethical in human participants. The humane treatment of animals is also very important. The use of animal subjects is covered by numerous regulations. Although many federal agencies have relevant regulatory controls, the two most important for biomedical research are the Public Health Service, PHS, and the United States Department of Agriculture. Institutions are given responsibility to implement federal regulations primarily through the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. Just like human research subjects require the approval of an IRB, Animal subject research require the approval of the IACUC. The committee consists of administrators, scientists, veterinarians, and community members that reviews proposals for research involving non-human animals. Functions of the IACUC are to review animal care every six months, inspect the housing facilities for animals, prepare reports or reviews for the institution, review concerns involving animals at the institution, make recommendations regarding the program or study to the institution, and review, approve, and require modifications to the animal use or project as needed. Further, they can suspend activities if a lab is not adhering to the approved uses. The USDA and NIH oversee institutional animal care and use committees. The USDA is in charge of making periodic and unannounced visits to assess the compliance for covered species. Standards for animal research must meet four standards. Animal research must have a clear scientific purpose. The research must answer a specific important scientific question. Animals are chosen based on their ability to help answer the question proposed. In animal research, the animals must be cared for and housed in a humane way. The living conditions must be appropriate for the species, and medical care must be available from a veterinarian. The animal subjects must be acquired in a legal manner. They must be purchased from accredited companies, and if trapped in the wild, they must be trapped in a humane manner. The experiment must be designed with procedures in place that employ the least amount of suffering on the part of the animals. In order to do this, personnel conducting the procedures must be qualified, and the research study must have a sound research design. Animals that would experience chronic pain must be euthanized at the end of the procedure, and the methods of euthanasia must abide by the American Veterinarian Medical Association rules. In today's video, we learned human and animal subjects have rights. Psychologists are bound by ethical guidelines. Codes of conduct have steadily evolved since the 1970s. Institutional review boards, IRBs, monitor compliance of federal regulations for human subjects. Institutional Animal Care and Use Committees, IACUCs, monitor compliance of federal regulations for animal subjects. For reflection, please take a few moments to consider the following open-ended question. What other fields or careers should follow a strict ethical code? I'd love to get your thoughts in the comments below. That's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we will discuss the role of biology in psychology. Before you go, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Stats with Taurus for more Psych 101. Looking forward to it. Ciao!